This is Teaching for Student Success. I'm Stephen Robineau. Higher education is undergoing a shift. We are recognizing the importance and value of diversity and inclusivity in our institutions, our classes, our majors, and in the workforce. Along with this recognition are efforts to increase the success and graduation of all of our students with particular attention to our historically excluded, minoritized, and first-generation students. This all seems like a great thing, and it is. However, many of us approach this work from the perspective of deficits. Students aren't succeeding because of what they're missing. An alternative perspective is anti-deficit, recognizing what students are doing and what they bring to the classroom to succeed. For example, instead of the deficit perspective, why don't certain groups of students persist, one might reframe the question and ask, how do certain groups of students manage to persist and earn degrees despite any number of negative forces that are working against them? Or, instead of asking why certain groups of students don't have strong relationships with faculty, one might reframe the question and ask, how do certain students cultivate meaningful relationships with faculty? I'm excited to welcome Dr. Julie Stanton, Associate Professor in the Department of Cell Biology at the University of Georgia in Athens, Georgia, to talk about her recent publication, Drawing on Internal Strengths and Creating Spaces for Growth, How Black Science Majors Navigate the Racial Climate at a Predominantly White Institution to Succeed, published in CBE Life Sciences Education in the spring of 2022. Welcome, Julie. First, let me congratulate you on your NSF Career Award that you received recently. Thank you for joining us on Teaching for Student Success. Thank you so much for having me, Steve. It's a pleasure to have an opportunity to talk about some of our work. Yeah, I'm excited to talk with you about it. So let, let's start with the problem. Please talk about what, what led you to undertake this study. What problem did you see? Well, for me, really, as an instructor, and I've been teaching the life sciences for about 15 years now, was that the messages that are being put forth in education research about Black students really didn't align with my personal experience as someone who taught students who are Black. And I saw them succeeding in my classroom and contributing in really powerful ways. And so I wondered why we had this narrative that students of color, as you said in the introduction, are really viewed with having all these deficits. I really wanted to turn things around and, and look at their success. What are those mechanisms? As I worked with a collaborator, Dr. Darris Means, who has been working in this area for a really long time, I realized that you know, you can't really look at mechanisms of success of Black students in science without also considering the reality of the racial climate that they're succeeding in. And so I think those were some of the things I really wanted to shed light on in this collaboration. Cool. Neither of us are Black. Reading your paper, it seems clear that you took efforts to put together a particular team to undertake this research. Can you talk about the team you assembled for that? Sure. So we took an approach that's called participatory action research. When you take a participatory action research or PAR approach, what you really do is you bring in the members of the community that you seek to study, and you really develop a shared leadership model at equal partnership, where together you will learn and then take what you learn and move that into action that can actually have an impact on the communities that you're trying to study. And so a lot of times in the past, as education researchers, we've gone in and tried to study students from marginalized groups, but they have critical expertise about their own experience that we don't have access to. And so as outsiders, we're limited not only in our ability to understand what's truly happening, but also in our ability to then take what we've learned to make changes that could be valuable for those students. So what we did um, in participatory action research is we really invited students who are black science majors to partner with us to study other black science majors. I have to say now that I've done this PAR approach, it's the only approach that I would take to studying students from marginalized groups 
I think that it's the most ethical way you can approach it. And the work is really enriched by having students who deeply understand and connect with that experience to work with you. Can you talk a little more specifically about the students who participated with you on the research? Sure. As authors, the, the, as opposed to the subjects. Yeah. So the first student that partnered with us was Wumi Oni, who at the time was a pre-dental student. She's now in dental school. She was a biological sciences major here at University of Georgia. She had actually come to meet with me to talk about potentially working on a metacognition research project I have in the lab. But Darius and I had been in conversation about studying the success of Black science majors. And because Wumi is Black and was a science major, I started discussing that project with her. And she really was the first student leader to join our team. Um, she was phenomenal in helping us shape the study. And really, she would, on more than one occasion, pause and tell Darius and tell me, look, the way that you're planning to do this is okay, but it's not going to work the way you think it will. And this is the approach you should take instead. So just to give you an, an example of that, we wanted to recruit students and we were using a model in the literature where you use a nomination process. So you go to faculty and ask them to nominate their successful students based on criteria you might provide those faculty and what Wumi told us is that, you know, that's nice. You might get one or two recommendations from science faculty at a large uh, research institution. But if you go to the presidents of the organizations that serve undergraduate students that include members who are black science majors, they're going to send you eight, nine, ten nominations. And she was right. I would say 75 percent or more of the students we wound up collecting data from were actually ones that the club presidents who were undergraduate leaders nominated because they they really know their members very well. So that's just one example of how Wumi as a leader really shaped how we went about this work, even how we would reach out to students to try to recruit them, you know, changing the language that we use, opening ourselves up not just to the traditional methods of email, but being willing to text groups that are on campus. So she was one of the authors on the paper. Another author that joined Wumi, Darius, and I was Brooke McConan. At the time, he was a master's in public health student, but he and I had collaborated together on education research projects studying learning objectives when he was an undergraduate. So he was interested in continuing to do research. He was also a black science major. He's now um, working for the U.S. Department of Defense in the area of public health, which is what his <laughs> master's is in. So the four of us really started out collecting this data. And then a year later, we were joined by Shemezia Sundu and Lola Babatola, two other black undergraduate science majors who helped form the team that collected and analyzed the data for the paper. Nice. That's, that's very interesting. Can you Expand on the issue that I introduced, just so people are familiar with it, this notion of looking through an anti-deficit perspective versus a deficit perspective. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, I'd be happy to. First, I'll start off by saying, you know, when we talk about a deficit approach, we're really talking about the way that we view students from marginalized groups. We ask questions like you brought up in the introduction, such as why do black students fail chemistry? There's a lot of this notion that if we could just supply Black students with certain resources or attributes, they would be successful. And so that's really taking a, an approach of saying they're lacking in something. If we give it to them, then they'll be successful. And what I really love about the anti-deficit achievement approach is it acknowledges that students are coming to us with a lot of strengths, abilities, contacts, they're just not the ones we're used to recognizing, so we don't see them. So I think part of why it's hard to get away from deficit thinking is if you think about it, our entire educational system is built on a deficit model. Students will come, we will supply them with what they're missing, and they will move on. But it's especially applied when it comes to students from racially marginalized groups. Interesting. Okay. And just to clarify, in, this, in your paper and in this work, 
black is referring to the, the diaspora more generally, not just African Americans, but people from Africa or other countries that are black that are here studying, right? That's right. That's right. Great. You said, and I was thinking about this when I read the deficit, anti-deficit portion of your paper and was reading a few other things. I never liked that, that, that the positive and the negative, somehow the anti-deficit that has that word anti, which, you know, has, sort of has an interesting, has connotations. But you also just said, and I hadn't heard this and I hadn't read this, you said anti-deficit sort of slash achievement approach. So is achievement also, instead of, is, is, is an alternative way to phrase this, is there a deficit approach, uh, perspective and is there an achievement perspective? Is, is achievement used as, a, as an alternative phrase for anti-deficit? I don't tend to see it used that way, but there is a phrase which is anti-deficit achievement approach, all one. Ah. Actually, there is a term anti-deficit achievement approach, so all four words together, and that was really put forth by Sean Harper. You know, I don't know the origins of it, but they're all used together as one term. Okay, I hadn't seen that. All right, so let's um, maybe can run us through your experimental design, or in this case, really your methods for data collection. Sure. So we decided to take a qualitative research approach to really collect really rich stories from participants. The way that we did this is we developed two semi-structured interview protocols, and semi-structured just means that you have a set list of questions, but you have the freedom to ask follow-up questions for clarification as it pertains to your research objectives. We had one interview with successful Black science majors in the fall and the spring of their senior year. So all of them had persisted to the senior year of a science major. What we did in the first interview is really formulate a protocol that addresses community cultural wealth, which is something put forth by Dr. Tara Yasso. Community cultural wealth involves knowledge, skills, abilities, contacts that students of color bring to their to their lives, really, but also to their education. And they can use this to really counteract oppression in various spaces. The way I think of it is non-financial assets. So you hear capital and you think money. But here we're thinking about things like, I'll give an example, navigational capital. So navigational capital for students from minoritized groups would be that ability they have to work within a system that was really not designed with them in mind, that was really designed for white and potentially male students. So our protocol is really set up to capture what forms of capital that black science majors are using. And the fall interview was one piece. And then the spring interview, I think, was really interesting because it involved two additional methods. In the first of those methods is known as card elicitation. Card elicitation is a method from anthropology, and it's used when you want to take participants' words and ideas and use them to help stimulate thought and conversation with other participants. So what we did was we analyzed the data from the fall interviews, and we were beginning to notice some themes and some key phrases or ideas brought forth. They were centered around the forms of capital that we were trying to study. And so in card elicitation, what we would do is provide a student with a set of five to six cards with different ideas written on them and invite them to choose any card that they felt was representative of their success. And then we would invite them to share a story or example about how that particular card related to them. So for example, one of the cards might have said, being focused when I need to be focused. So a student could select that card and then decide to talk about it. The reason why card elicitation was so important for this study is because we're trying to learn about strengths that Black science majors possess. But these are strengths that are not recognized by predominant culture and sometimes not even recognized by the students themselves. And so in order to get them to talk about these ideas, 
card elicitation is a valuable method for that. And I will just offer that, you know, one thing as a scientist trained in cell biology, I would worry about is, well, if you put a card in front of a student, you could plant an idea. And so part of our analysis does involve, when we look at card elicitation, going back to the original interview and seeing, do we see the roots of these ideas in the original interview reflected here? Or does this seem to just be prompting a student to go down a path that maybe is not actually relevant for how they persisted in their science major? And then the other method that we used in our spring interview that was also really powerful is something called photo elicitation. And so between the two interviews, we invited the student participants to submit to us somewhere between five and 10 photographs, or some of them preferred to submit a short video that represented their success in science. And again, here, photo elicitation can be a really wonderful method because it allows you to gain access to ideas and feelings, thoughts that maybe are not so readily put into words. But during the interviews, we would open up the photos that the students had sent to us, share them on the screen if we were interviewing them virtually or in person, and invite them to talk about that. And we found that we really could gain access to some really important pieces in terms of what was allowing the participants to thrive in their science majors. So in terms of the photo elicitation, let's say student John sent you three photos, you would show him the photos that he sent. That's right. As opposed to the cards, everybody saw the same card set. But the, that card set was based on themes you pulled out from the fall, from the fall surveys, the fall discussions. That's right. So the cards were not specific to the students, although we did invite students at the end of the card activity to add a card if there was something mm -hmm. important that was not present there. And those cards were really interesting too. We had one student write the equivalent of money on the card and just say, "Let's put it out there. Like money is required to be in college," and so. Uh, we also had some of that, but you're correct. The photos for the photo elicitation piece were the ones that the participant themselves had selected and sent to us. Right. And then they spoke about those in the interview. Interesting. Very nice. Yeah. Those must've been great stories, right? So they start out as nonverbal, but they have to translate them to verbal for you. So that has to be an interesting moment. Okay, so let's let's talk about the findings. What are the major ways that students, in spite of a system that isn't, uh, let's say, most welcoming for them, how are these students succeeding? What are their strategies? Yeah, so one of the major findings from this particular study was that the black students that we had interviewed were at a predominantly white institution. First, we had to really understand the racial climate that they experienced at the university in order to put their entire experience in context. And so we did learn quite a bit about how isolating it can be to be a black science major, especially as you persist through to the junior and senior years. We also learned that microaggressions were very common on campus uh, whereas more overt forms of racism were not as common. And I think one of the things that was clear to us and we knew as, as a team is that those microaggressions can be exhausting because here's a case where you're not sure, is this person being racist or are they not? And that uncertainty can really weigh on a person versus if someone says something overtly racist, that's harmful in many ways. But it's clear in that case what is happening versus something that's much more covert. Right. You talked about primarily white institutions. Those are institutions where m more than 50% of the students identify as white. Is that correct? Right. The majority of students at the university are white. And usually historically, the institution has been predominantly serving white students. So that term, interestingly, as I was reading, is actually not a Department of Education term. That's not recognized officially, but it's being used more commonly now. And of the 4,000, approximately 4,000 degree-granting institutions, post-secondary degree-granting institutions, 
I suspect a great many of them are primarily white institutions at this point still. I think you're right. I think the majority of the universities across the country are what we would call PWIs. And it's interesting, you know, every black science student I've talked to knows what a PWI is, right? But not every student at the university knows what a PWI is. And it makes sense, right? Because if you're black, you have to know. It's going to affect your entire experience. Whereas if you're a white student, it's not going to have that kind of impact on your day-to-day life. So it's been interesting to realize how, you know, we have the privilege maybe of not having to keep track of terms like this, but definitely every black student that we talk to would readily talk about PWI without using any other language but that. Interesting. And in terms of number of students, you had 34 in your study? That's right. We had 34 students in our study, and 27 of them participated in the second interview. They were all graduating seniors, so one of the things we found was they were incredibly busy, and so some of them were not available for the second interview. Okay, great. All right, well, let's continue on talking about what they do to succeed, to persist. Right, and so I think it's really important to consider the racial climate that they are succeeding in because... What we found is that there's a form of community cultural wealth called resistant capital, which our abilities a student might gain as a result of having to really confront racism and various forms of oppression. And it's really hard, I'll be honest with you, Steve, for me to talk about resistant capital because I have to do so very carefully. The reason being is that I don't want anyone to walk away thinking, well, As a result of racism, there's the silver lining in which you gain all these skills. That's not the message I want to deliver to you or to your listeners today. I want to be really clear that this is just part of the reality of the student's experience. But what we found is that students in our study develop various forms of resistant capital, such as being able to educate people when they said things that were racist that were ignorant. Some of them felt like they had the bandwidth and the energy to stop someone and correct them and hope that through conversation, they could have an impact where that person maybe would not continue to (laughs) say things of the nature that led to the conversation. Mm -hmm. A really interesting form of community cultural wealth that was related to the racial climate was the code switching. And code switching is a form of linguistic capital where linguistic capital is abilities gained from being able to communicate. And usually we talk about more than one language, but also more than one communication style. Right. Code switching was something that was very challenging for our group to study, to, to analyze the data for. And we had a wide range of views and positions in the room as we were analyzing the data and the students themselves also did. And so I would offer that it ranged from students who felt like code switching was essential for survival in the face of anti-Black racism. There is no choice but to sound as white as you can sound and fit and assimilate or you just won't succeed. And so there were students who knew that they did it automatically but they really used the word survival, and it wasn't something they viewed as positive. We saw a whole range. So we also saw students at the other end who felt like code switching was something that they could use to their advantage, that they really learned how to harness. And because they were so good at code switching, this allowed them to maneuver in spaces that Black science majors are not normally found. And really be at the top of their field. So just to give you an example, we had one participant who knew she was a very powerful speaker. So when she went to a science conference, the level of animation she could bring while still code switching within the boundaries of that discipline, she felt allowed her to be very successful in connecting with the audience and communicating her ideas about her research But there were lots of different feelings in between where students felt like 
code switching prevented them from being who they really were in order to connect with white people in powerful places, whether that was their white peers or their white faculty members or white administrators. And there were other students who looked at code switching as a positive just for the sake of professionalism. So they said, you know, if you're going into an interview, you wouldn't talk the same way that you would talk with your friends. Our team was really interested to explore the nuances around code switching. This ability um, was one that different students had a lot of different feelings about, sometimes very conflicted. I'm glad you raised code switching because that's one that I actually took some some notes on because I, in the courses that you're talking about it, so this is also true in, in probably every field, is that there is a language, there's a vocabulary that exists or that has developed over time. And that vocabulary is important. I, I know when you're a cell biologist, uh, you know, there's just a special, there's a whole set of vocabulary. You just have to know these words because those words have meaning and, and that's how we converse with each other so that we don't have to start at ground zero every time, right? You use a certain vocabulary. That's different. Using a vocabulary is different than code switching, I think, I hope. But I, uh, yeah, so I wanted to talk a little bit about that, about, I mean, if you're taking a French course, you have to learn the French words. That's the whole point of speaking French. And if you go to a biology class, you you learn a language. If you go to a multicultural gender studies course, there is going to be a language there that they use. Talk about that. I'm interested in that and that distinction between professional vocabulary versus code switching. Yeah, this is a really important question. And I think it ties back to what I said earlier, where as a research team, we often wondered ourselves because we knew that most everyone feels like there's circumstances where they're going to speak differently than they normally do, whether it's at home versus work. Um, I think even one of the participants said everyone has a code switch. I think what's different here is the extent to which the students are code switching and the idea that the way that they would commonly speak and interact with other students who are black or other people who are black, there are a lot greater risks for them to continue talking that way in, in these spaces what I would offer is maybe the level of risk, the cost is much higher. When I go home tonight, I might joke around with my family and talk a little differently than I do on the podcast. If I were to kind of joke around with you, there might be some conclusions you or your listeners might come to, but I don't think they would reach the level that one experiences because of anti-Black racism in our country. Right. That's how I would describe it, but I'm happy to try to answer a follow-up question on that. No, that's fine. And as you were saying that, I was thinking about uh, this other issue in, in communicating with our students. There are sort of two types of discussions going on when we talk to our students. One involves content, and the other is non-content talk that we have. Kimberly Tanner, and we've had a couple of people talk about instructor talk. You're familiar with instructor talk, I'm pretty sure. So you have this content talk and non-content talk, and maybe that's a distinction there because you use, of course, the vocabulary when you're talking content. When you want to talk about how some process works, you're going to use a certain vocabulary. But maybe the difference here in code switching is that when students just come into class and, and talk to each other, not even about content necessarily, just sort of socially, or when students approach a faculty member, and hopefully everybody is has some civil presence to say, hello, how are you, what you're, you know, and learn about the student a little bit. You're not talking content, so you don't have to use a special vocabulary, but there a code switch is being used a lot is what you're saying, that students are switching when they're coming to talk to faculty. And I'm wondering if it's this non-content talk that is particularly the areas that are where the code switch occurs. It's a good question. I think it's the entirety of how they're presenting themselves. And, and to be honest, I, I can see how it's completely exhausting because it's not, you're correct. It's not just what they're saying, but I think it's everything they're saying and even how they're presenting themselves. One participant talked about wearing braids in her hair and that she predicted would not be well perceived by mm. folks who were interviewing her. So she removed them and, and adopted a different hairstyle. So it's 
students feeling like the entirety of who they are and bringing to the classroom has to be altered at the extreme of feeling like assimilation to survive. And that is because of how the culture is impacting them and the messages that we're giving them about who belongs in this space and who doesn't. Mm -hmm. That level of the entirety of who you are bringing to the classroom, feeling that pressure to be someone else, it's a little different and it could involve non-content, but it also involves content. It's, It's everything you would say and do almost. Now you're bringing in a new level, which makes complete sense that it's really everything, every way in which they present themselves or, or one presents oneself, right? It's not just speech, it's manner, it's dress, it's, there's so many issues there. Although all the prior talk I've heard about code switching is, is talking about verbal, you're adding a, a, a different level that undoubtedly is true, right? That, that. You know, they're changing the way one changes the way you do your hair or the way one dresses or depending on how you want to be seen and perceived. Right. And that that really comes from our participants and how they talked about code switching yeah. when they were asked about it. And they definitely saw it, like you're saying, as, as going beyond just speech. So uh, you have these six forms of capital you talk about. You've talked a little bit about resistance. We're sort of talking about linguistic now. It is. And linguistic capital is really fascinating because the way Dr. Tara Yasso first proposed linguistic capital from years of data that she and collaborators have collected was really for students who could speak more than one language. And what were the abilities you gain from being bilingual or trilingual in some cases? But interestingly, linguistic capital also includes the ability to tell stories or to express oneself through the arts. And it's something that people don't often talk about when they talk about linguistic capital. But I will share, it wasn't a focus of this paper, but we definitely, in a follow-up study, explored a little bit more. Um, Students definitely talked about how the arts, how music, dance, even painting. One student talked at length about cooking in a way that I've never thought of before. And so the way that they were utilizing these forms of art really fit within Yasso's idea of linguistic capital. So so we could think of it not only as abilities gained from being bilingual, trilingual, or being able to communicate in two different styles, but also abilities gained through expression in the arts. So that's not in this particular paper, but it's something in a forthcoming paper. Interesting. Well, we'll look yeah. forward to that. Let's talk about hmm, aspirational capital. Yeah, so aspirational capital is about how students can maintain their hopes and dreams for the future, even in the face of barriers that are very real and some barriers that might just be perceived. And this type of capital is pervasive throughout the data. It is so strong. It's seen in every participant. It's actually the first paper that we started writing, and that paper just took longer to publish, and it's accepted and going to be in print soon. But Students that we've studied, they have such a strong idea of who they are, who they want to be, what is their career goal, and the degree to which they remain set on that goal is not the same as what you would see in another group of students. And a lot of it has to do with what are their motivations for their aspiration. So for example, The students in our study who wanted to become physicians were deeply motivated to serve communities that were underserved, specifically Black communities. And they had seen the way that members of their family felt like they couldn't trust a doctor. Mm -hmm. And so their desire to become a doctor was tied to a lot of other things that may not always be in play for another type of student. Aspirational capital really helps students, even if they weren't succeeding at first the way that we would traditionally imagine a student succeeding, one of the things aspirational capital, I think, does is inspire these students to see, I don't have to take the path that other students take. In fact, the path that other students take may not be available to me because of a history of anti-Black racism in this country. There are certain structural barriers that would prevent 
a black science major from taking the same path as a white science major. So I think it's really fascinating to look and say, well, as university faculty, we might imagine someone having to take a certain class more than once or having to pursue a post-baccalaureate program. We might look at that and frame it a certain way. Students in our study are really just thinking the path can be whatever it's going to be. It will be hard and, and without a doubt, the degree of stress they experienced was very clear, but they're so committed that they're willing to find another path where they can succeed because they're so tied to these goals. Again, because they often are going well beyond themselves as an individual. I'll just add, I mentioned, you know, wanting to serve a community and having really strong ties to the community. Another thing we saw was how aspirational capital is tied to familial capital. So there's really strong ties to family. And a lot of the students talked about how important it was for them to really provide an example for brothers and sisters or cousins, younger family members. And this type of aspirational capital of wanting to really honor the family and build on their family's success or succeed in a way that beyond their parents was very clear in the data. It's, it's not a major focus of this paper that we're talking about today, but it's definitely something we've seen from the participants who were interviewed for this particular paper. In the paper, even though this may not be the focus, you do t talk about students or students talk in their own words in your paper about how basically any obstacle that is thrown at them they're not going to let it stop them. They're, they're going to get around this one way or the other, right? Whether it's people saying negative things or whether it's institutional blockage in one way or another, they're going to find a way. Yeah, and I think that was really interesting to us in, in this paper was to think about what are the internal strengths that allow them to continue pursuing these goals. And like you said, one of them was this failure is not an option, but it was it was taken to a different degree. And I was really appreciative because members of the research team pointed out, while this is not true for all participants, but for some participants, this sort of steadfast commitment, no matter what happens. I mean, one student, their quote is sort of like they've tried to quit so many times, but their body will not let them quit <laughs> pursuing a science degree. One of the co-researchers brought this up in a meeting and said, a lot of students don't have generational wealth to fall back on. That's not true for all participants. I want to make that clear in the study. But the co-researchers started to talk about how different it is when you don't have that generational wealth from your parents or grandparents or anyone else, knowing that you are going to have to make it work. It just adds into that failure is not an option piece in a way that is really different for black science majors. And this gives me a chance to just say something that, you know, when we first were sharing these results, a lot of my colleagues would say, oh yeah, failure is not an option. I feel that way or internally motivated. I feel that way. But we really tried to caution our readers and I'll caution your listeners from over-identifying because the reasons like the one I just kind of revealed are usually very different. So just to build on that, one of the really important themes was those internal strengths. And, and the students talk about internal motivation, how they're internally motivated to succeed. But within this background of a predominantly white institution, they explained to us, you know, when you're in a place where people are expecting you to fail, you can't look at people around you to uplift you. If you don't have that drive in yourself, there's going to be so many things telling you implicitly or otherwise that you're not going to make it. And so I think, you know, that's a great example. A lot of us in our lives can feel like, oh, this is a case where I've had internal motivation. But I think that if we think about what's happening for the students in the study, the reasons why the degree to which they feel it, it is very different. Right. That, I think, will, moves us into social capital. Sure. This notion of, of students in a, you know, black students in a sea of people that don't look like them but they develop social capital at their institutions. And that be becomes a very important piece of the puzzle. You want to talk about that? I'd love to. So the social capital piece was really fascinating as an outsider um, to study with insights given by the research team who are in fact insiders. So one of the very first things we learned about 
was just how well connected black science majors are. And we learned about BUGA, which stands for Black UGA. And I do have permission of the co-researchers to name BUGA. This was actually a point we discussed many times in research meetings, because often in a study like this, you would not mention the university, Mm -hmm. but they felt it was important. So BUGA stands for Black UGA, and it's really, if you're a Black student at UGA, you're a part of BUGA if you want to be. But it's a very informal group. It, in some ways, consists of a group text that I can't even imagine how large it is, and other ways of informally connecting. And it's not um, front-facing. In other words, there are Black students on campus who are not yet aware of BUGA. They will be brought in, but they haven't yet. And so it, it was interesting to, to learn about this really important informal community that exists. What was really fascinating to me about Bugo is just how a student who was Black at the university could reach out through text or other methods to hundreds of students on campus and say, I need help with this. Who can help me? And people will help. People will respond. If we remember the context again of a predominantly white institution, sometimes what they're doing is saying, I'm thinking about doing research with Dr. Sam. Is she okay? So they're checking us out informally. They they know they have these networks in order to navigate this space, which is sometimes quite hostile to them. I had wondered why after I came to UGA, I started right away. The first undergraduate collaborators I had happened to be Black. And then students would come to my office or reach out to me and ask for opportunities. And I don't know for sure, but it's likely through this network that they found out, okay, this this person could be okay for you to go and do research with. Mm -hmm. And so I think what's beautiful about it is it helped me realize how well connected the students are. But what's very sobering about it is realizing, well, what are the conditions that set things up so that they have to have this type of network? I'll offer that it's also very uplifting for them. I think they find places where they can thrive. So spaces that are safe within the institution where they can trade or not trade really, but share navigational capital, share what they've learned about how to make it at the university and pass on resources that other students have been passing on for many, many years, but they've not yet had access to. So it was pretty powerful to see, you know, Bugga is just one example, but there's so many examples that were provided by the participants of those deep, deep connections they have. Right. You talk about a number of official organizations within the university. Bugga is not one of those. Bugga just sort of seems like a, it's something that exists. Somehow it's maintained. It's nothing official on campus, right? That's right. And it was interesting. One of our participants said to us, if you have a club officially, that club can continue on. But if you have an informal group, if it's not valuable, it just dies out. And Bugga has not died out because Bugga is so valuable. And there's other communities like Bugga on campus, some of which we named in the paper and some of which we didn't. But I think his point is well taken is that these informal communities are so strong because they are providing essential, I would use the term navigational capital, but essential resources and connections and comfort and and so on for students that they continue to persist or continue to exist at the university. Right. And another part of that that I found interesting and and maybe this is makes sense right when you're when you're the minority group or a minority group in in a situation that students would help each other even if they didn't know the other student it was enough that hey you're another black student on campus i'm going to help you we're all in this together that's sort of the feeling i got students are there for each other whether they know them at this moment or not they'll they'll get to know them obviously That's right. They would talk about a silent code they had where if another Black student reaches out to you, doesn't matter if you know them or not, you will provide them with the information or resources they're seeking. They would just talk about, I got you. I got your back. If I can help you, I will. There was not a sense amongst the participants of competition. It was really, if I can get an A, I want you to get an A too. If I can succeed, I want you to succeed too. Right. I think what was really 
powerful for us as a team was realizing a lot of faculty like myself, we want to help and we're, we're often unsure or we have limited time and energy. And one of the things that came through in the data and talking with the co-researchers is the idea that you don't have to, as a faculty member, try to take on supporting the success of all students who are Black all at once. That if you were intentional in creating spaces in your classroom, that you could take even actions on an individual basis that would be powerful because of the students' community cultural wall. So in the paper, we talk about this multiplier factor, the idea that if a faculty member devote some time and attention to supporting the success of a black student in their class, that that student is very likely because of the reason you named of this willingness to help anyone, they're going to pass that on to multiple students. So you have this potential, not just to help the student who might be in front of you in office hours, but everyone that they're going to be connected with, that they're going to share the knowledge and, and so on with. So that I think was something we really, as a team, was really powerful for us when we try to talk to faculty who feel really unsure of what what they can do. You mentioned navigational capital, and that's sort of the last one we haven't talked about, like aspirational, right? It sort of pervades all of these other capitals as well, learning to navigate in in a stranger in a strange land. Definitely. We saw navigational capital throughout the data, largely because we were doing this in the context of a predominantly white institution. We've since gone on to study community cultural wealth in other institutions that are not predominantly white, and we don't Hmm. see navigational capital used to the same extent, Hmm. interestingly. You're absolutely right. This idea of being an environment that was not originally designed with you in mind, that is something black science majors in our study faced time and again. As they figured out, how do I make this work? What are the unwritten rules, really, of this institution? Then often they were passing that on to other students. You're, you're absolutely right. That was seen throughout the data. Yeah. And so have you, so you intimated here, have you done this work at a predominantly black institution or at HBCU, a historically black college or university, and you're getting different, you're seeing differences? Well, we're studying community cultural wealth. We have looked at an institution that is now predominantly students from racially marginalized groups, but is not an HBCU. Mm -hmm. It's a two-year college that now offers a few four-year degrees here in the state of Georgia. And then we also looked at another four-year college that has not been in existence for that long, but it's part of the university system of Georgia. In both those places, they're not predominantly white institutions. We're seeing some things that are different. Those analyses are ongoing and papers forthcoming. I'll just share that, you know, there's one institution where we collected data It's a smaller school, but the degree to which the students are connected to their faculty is really phenomenal and made some of the co-researchers wish they would have attended this other (laughs) college. And it's a public (laughs) college here in the state of Georgia. So we're really interested to see how that social capital gain from those very I mean, these are relationships that go beyond, you know, a student found themselves homeless and they lived in their, really their biology instructor's basement for a couple of months. The degree to which those faculty are going out of their way to help these students find their path, it's inspiring. And also as a researcher, it's really fascinating. So we're looking forward to putting those stories together. But I will just mention, we we did make a conscious choice not to study HBCUs because there has been some really good work done about community cultural wealth at HBCUs. So that was part of Mm -hmm. our intention was to look at places where it hadn't really been discussed before. Right. The notion of the relationships between faculty and students, that that's a key element of student success. 
is a theme that runs through my podcast. I think it comes up a lot. So to hear you talk about that, it's heartwarming to hear it. It must be hard and challenging because faculty are busy doing all kinds of things. And so, but, but at the same time, it must be incredibly rewarding to be in an institution that values faculty student relationships so much. Thanks. We'll look forward to that paper and uncovering who that is. So your students can maybe go there or, or other institutions can model that model them. Right. Right. That's awesome. All this discussion of capital, we've been talking about STEM student success. Do you think this applies to non-STEM students as well? Absolutely. I'm confident that community cultural wealth exists for students, regardless of what they're pursuing a degree in. I don't think it's been as well studied as in STEM. There's quite a few studies of community cultural wealth, say in engineering, as one example within STEM. But... I imagine if uh, someone was motivated, and there's probably people already doing this work, they would definitely find how these forms of capital are helping students thrive in, say, the humanities as just one example. Okay. Yeah, I think so, too. I can't see how this isn't true in pretty much every field on campus, right? Mm -hmm. Students are in this environment, and they need to succeed, and it isn't easy. We've covered all the navigational, all the capitals uh, that that you talked about. We at least touch on them all. I'm wondering what advice do you have for faculty? What things can they do? You know, what could somebody go into their classroom tomorrow and do differently to help their minoritized, their excluded students or their black students? I mean, this is about black students, but but these sorts of issues affect all the minoritized students and marginalized students and students that have been historically excluded, not just black students, for sure. What can faculty do? I'm going to begin by saying something that our research team has talked a lot about, and that is that it's really hard to offer advice that could be utilized right away, because I think what we know as, as researchers and people in this space is that faculty really need to spend quite a bit of time to become more aware of the situations their students are in and become more knowledgeable about what it might be like for their students. And so I can offer, without a doubt, a couple of things that people could try, but I just want to preface it by saying I think there's a journey we all have to take in becoming increasingly aware. That awareness is going to help us not just in things we could implement tomorrow, but in our whole way of thinking about students from racially marginalized groups. So I just want to make sure I say that before I offer a few things, because we actually had a a research team policy for a while that we wouldn't actually make any specific (laughs) recommendations, but you can imagine most audiences that we interact with want a few at least. So I definitely would say that one of the first things that faculty can do is try to tap into the existing networks. We know that black science majors and likely, although I I don't want to say for sure when I haven't studied students from other racially marginalized groups, may have existing structures that we can plug into. So for example, the Lewis Stokes Alliance for Minority Participation is a very big program on campus. Many participants talked about how instrumental it was. So rather than me trying to create my own series, why not go to the LSAM program and say, I'm really interested in supporting the students in your program. What can I do? Can I plug into this existing mixer you have for faculty and students? Can I offer to be on a panel or something? So I think working within these already developed communities that Black students have is a great way forward. The other thing I would say is I think it's helpful to just speak openly with your class about your commitment to equity and that you would be willing to discuss with them any issues that arise in or out of the class. I noticed myself when I started to really intentionally say that out loud in class and also include it in my sub- syllabus. I've had more students come to me, um, bring up issues, potentially things like microaggressions that we, we've had the opportunity then to work together to address. I'll just say, because I know that a lot of listeners might know about evidence-based approaches to teaching, so I myself use a lot of group work 
And so I think that's a space where we can be a little bit intentional about what might be happening for black science majors when they're asked to work in small groups. So one of the things that we learned is participants in a PWI didn't really like when they could randomly pick the groups because often they were one of a few students of color and they often got left out. So thinking about potentially assigning groups could be a way forward. Another thing that I've noticed and that participants talked about too is within groups, Black students' voices are not necessarily valued as much as white students. I've been intentional when students are working in groups to go around and um, listen and then amplify the voices of my students who happen to be black that are correct, that are bringing a lot of insight and sort of recognizing that in front of the group or in front of the class in a way that's not performative, but just acknowledging what they're doing could also be a useful step. So those are just a couple of ideas, but I do want to underscore just that importance of trying to find out what's happening on your campus, what it might be like for students who are Black on your campus, and really starting to understand that so your first moves are from a place of awareness, which is really difficult to develop and is taking me a while, and I'm continuing on that journey. I haven't finished it yet. Right. Well, it starts with curiosity, doesn't it? Right. You're meeting students where they are instead of them having to come to you. For example, going to clubs or mixers or events that clubs have, that's a fact. Remember, going to the students in their in their place, in their space. I think that's really important and being humble about the fact that it's not their job to tell you how to treat them better <laughs> in a way. You know, it's sort of like saying, Okay, I'm a, I've been oppressing you for centuries. How should I do better? I mean, they want to be able to answer that, but they're not necessarily going to know. And it's a really difficult position to put them in. Meeting them where they're at, like you're saying, becoming more aware, paying attention, thinking for yourself. Then maybe go to a student and say, I have this idea. What do you think? But really turning to them to ask them to solve a problem that you are the root cause of or you you and the, the society at large is, <laughs> is really not something I would recommend and is not likely to be appreciated, <laughs> although I can understand the intention. And for more on group work, oh, I, have a, I have a couple of episodes with Peggy Brickman on this podcast and where she talks about a number of these issues. So I encourage people to go back and listen to some of those episodes. They're great. Okay, so Julie, you are a cell biologist. You were trained in a lab, you know, traditional of work that m- many of us did. And you're in a department of cell biology. But a lot of your publications now and a lot of your current work, and maybe all of it, I, I'm not certain, is in the field of st- student success, metacognition, all of these issues about f- for students, which really centers around their success. Why did you go down that road? What's your story? What what transformed? Because I assume that you didn't go get a degree in cell biology to do this necessarily. Something happened somewhere along the way. I want to know about that. Yeah. So I had a experience when I was an undergraduate at Truman State University. I was out of state and they gave a lot of scholarships, but they had a scholarship job and you could, you know, swipe IDs in the weight room or um, the cafeteria. And, and the job I had was to be a teaching assistant for the faculty who taught science labs. So I realized I love teaching. And so I went to graduate school because I love cell biology and I wanted to be a teacher. I really enjoyed cell and molecular biology research, but again, my primary motivation for going to graduate school was always to teach. And so I've always been fascinated in thinking about how students learn, how, what can we do to better support student learning in graduate school? I took a course where I first learned about metacognition, which is our awareness and control of thinking for learning. And so it just turned out in my first faculty position, I was doing research with undergraduates in what's called a course based undergraduate research program through the Howard Hughes medical Institute It really changed my life, but it also meant that the research I was doing in a molecular biology lab had to change because there was such a demand on my time of teaching this course. That's when someone said, you know, why don't you think about studying how students learn, studying 
biology education research. And so I started to try to teach myself while I was at Washington State University in my first faculty position. And then I had the opportunity to come to University of Georgia to be trained um, and mentored by people who are really at the top of the field, including Dr. Peggy Brickman, who you just mentioned. I really felt very, very fortunate to have the opportunity to work with people who have been generous with their time and expertise. But it really fits with this lifelong interest I've had in how could I be a better teacher and how could I help students learn more effectively. And I find students fascinating. I don't study faculty because I don't find them as interesting yet. But studying undergraduates in collaboration with other undergraduates has really been fulfilling. So it really came out of this fact that I didn't take a certain type of scholarship job, but I took a TA job and really fell in love with teaching. So this line of research really aligns with those long-term interests I've had. Nice. Interesting. So that's interesting. During your undergraduate career, you had an experience that really impacted you and really set the course of your career. And that had to do when you were, as you just said, you were a TA uh, as as a job. So that's cool. And now you have just used undergraduates in your research through a mechanism called Participatory Action Research, PAR, which you've talked about through this podcast. And I just want to come back to any final thoughts you have about your co-researchers, because this is a really unique aspect of your research. And I think that's worth spending some last words on. So maybe you'd like to say a few more words about participatory action research and your co-researchers. Thank you. In this work, in participatory action research, we refer to our undergraduate collaborators as co-researchers, just to really emphasize the fact that we're partnering together and trying to have shared leadership without hierarchies, which is really challenging sometimes when you come from a science background where there's the PI, postdoc, graduate student, undergraduate. So we try to break all that down. I'm really amazed at the work the co-researchers have done. So just as an example... They take the lead on all aspects of the project, including recruiting new members to our team. We asked if anyone would be interested, and two students took us up on the offer. And I was so impressed by their approach that they outlined, including how they were going to contact students, what they would ask students to provide, and then the rubrics they generated (laughs) to assess the candidates. And so there's a lot of ownership and agency that the co-researchers have to really take over all parts of the study. But another piece I'll just highlight because I'm really proud of the collaborators I have who happen to be, you know, 20 and 21 years old, maybe. They developed a workshop for faculty based on our findings to really mm. address racial and bias. They created this workshop in partnership with the Center for Teaching and Learning. So they met with the director of that center. Hmm. They met with the vice provost for institutional diversity. And they put together something that really allows faculty to learn about implicit bias, to look at scenarios that have come from our own research of different microaggressions and overt racism that students have encountered, and think about ways they could address that And then learn about community cultural wealth, because when we have these implicit biases, they're brought to us from all around us. And and we need to be really intentional about replacing those negative ideas we might have about black students with really intentional, positive ideas. So they also bring in a lot of the community cultural wealth, what we've learned from our studies to help science faculty be able to replace some of those ideas and start to be aware and recognize that in their students. So they've given this workshop three times to over 60 faculty. So if you can imagine being 20 years old and telling your chemistry instructor, all right, now let's talk about the types of racial implicit bias you found in your test and how you might handle these issues. They've done an amazing job and they've now recorded all of those sessions into many sessions that will be available online freely to faculty across the country who might want to do this training. So they, I think they have five or six modules that 
they've professionally recorded with related activities, including, you know, making an action plan for how you'll make a more welcoming environment in your classroom for students who are Black. I just wanted to share that because I'm so proud of the work that they have done there. That's awesome. If you'll provide me with a link, we will put that on our website so that uh, faculty and administrators and whoever can access uh, those tools. That sounds incredible. Are they ready? Are they available currently or soon? Right now, they're only available on campus at UGA. So we're working to get them housed somewhere where folks outside the university could have them. It might take us a little while, but as okay. soon as we have that, I'll, I'll be happy to share it. I can always update our website if it isn't, uh, if it isn't there when we get this online. Mm-hmm. That's a great story. Have you seen your interactions with your co-researchers? Has it changed what they want to do? What has it done for them? This is a great question. So one of our newer co-researchers wanted to know the answer to that. So she designed a study where she interviews past members of our team who have graduated. Mm. If I remember correctly, there's four major themes, but I'll just mention one of them right now. That is that the co-researchers were very deeply connected to the stories of the participants. In some cases, the graduated co-researchers would talk about it's almost like therapy to do these interviews because you're she said asking the question of a black science major but you yourself are a black science major so you're reflecting on your own experience Mm -hmm. and so they talked about how this process helped them really know themselves and Mm -hmm. know about the forms of capital they possess and what they're passionate about many of them have gone on to really embrace social justice and working for change they've mostly gone on to professional school, whether it's medical school or dental school. Mm -hmm. And so being a change agent at their medical school or dental school based on the experience on this project and really being a part of not just the research, but the action you take using the research to, to promote change. So that's been really interesting. They also talked a lot about skills they've gained in leadership. So when you're really put in charge of your colleagues or collaborators, even when one of your collaborators is a professor, how they learn to hold people accountable and how they learn to hold themselves accountable. Hmm. They've shared a lot about their leadership skills they've gained through PAR because they so much of the responsibility is up to them if they want to be responsible for it. So they, you know, whereas when I was doing molecular biology research with undergraduates, on day one, I can't turn over you know, major parts of the project because they don't have the background. When you're a black science major studying black science majors, you already have a rich lived experience to offer. And then, of course, you know, guidance from the rest of the team if it's something you've never done before. The benefits of the co-researchers is something that one of our current co-researchers is studying. So it's very meta. We're studying Mm -hmm. the folks who graduated from our team and really excited to learn about that. And also that's got to be very rewarding to know that, I mean, not just the research you're doing is interesting and important, but that the co-researchers that you've, uh, that you've interacted with very closely, that this experience has really impacted their lives in a, in a positive way. That's, that's a great thing. It is a great thing. And honestly, Steve, they've impacted me very deeply. So I don't know <laughs> if it's if I want to take credit for that direction as much as I want to acknowledge like, how much I've learned from them and being humbled every day and really for them to be willing to just say, hey, Julie, no, that's not it. You're wrong. <laughs> and, you know, they could have just mm-hmm. brushed over it and moved on. But their willingness to work with me even when I stumbled was really was really powerful for me. Well, that speaks volumes, right, of the space that you created for them, the safe space that you created to have that uh, dialogue. That's what we aim for. Congratulations. Thank you. It's great. Well, I think this is a great place to stop. I'm going to say for more information about Dr. Stanton, her research, and her favorite books and papers, please go to our website, teachingforstudentsuccess.org. Thank you for spending time with us today. Please share our podcast and website with your friends, colleagues, and administrators. We love hearing from our listeners, so please contact us through our website. If an episode has impacted your teaching, please send us a note and let us know what impacted you, what you've done in your classroom, 
and how it has impacted your students. Julie just nodded her head there. So yeah, so this episode, if you go and do something and it impacts you, let us know. We'd love to hear. Teaching for Student Success is a production of Teaching for Student Success Media. Let's end this podcast with some music of Julius H. Some of Julius's music can be found on Pixabay. Thank you.